thank you for being here today. Uh, I welcome you to our virtual lunch discussion. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Bradley Jackson, Senior Program Officer at the Institute for Humane Studies, and I'll be joined uh, today by Sean Stevens from the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education and Musa Algarbi from Columbia University. And we're going to be discussing the College Free Speech Rankings Report that was recently released by FIRE in partnership with Real Clear Education. Uh, first, a quick reminder of who the Institute for Humane Studies is. At IHS, we're committed to advancing higher education's core purpose of intellectual discovery and human progress. My own work here focuses primarily on questions re relating to free speech and open inquiry, uh, as well as the state of liberal democracy and civil discourse in the country. FIRE's College Free Speech Rankings Report, which was recently released, is based on a survey of 20,000 students. The findings raise serious concerns about students' willingness to share their views with peers, especially on topics of vital national concerns, such as race relations and immigration policy, and other topics that we'll be discussing today. So why does this matter? And particularly, why does it matter right now? Well, with tribalism and nationalism increasing outside of the academy, Colleges have an essential role in shoring up the future of liberalism by fostering productive dialogue, independent thinking, and inclusive communities. If you believe in the higher purpose of the university, you should be concerned about the questions raised by FIRE's report. For those of you whose academic work might focus on free speech or open inquiry like my own, we'll be discussing today how you might apply some of these findings to your own work as well. I want to quickly introduce our speakers today, Sean and Musa. Uh, Sean Stevens is a senior research fellow in polling and analytics at the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education, FIRE, and he holds a PhD in social psychology from Rutgers, New Brunswick. Prior to joining FIRE, Sean served as Heterodox Academy's first director of research, where he developed the Campus Expression Survey. Musa Algarbi is Paul F. Lazarfeld Fellow in sociology at Columbia University. He has MA degrees in sociology and philosophy and BA degrees in Near Eastern studies and philosophy. His work has been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, the New Republic, and countless other outlets, including NBC News this morning. And you've likely seen him, uh, seen some of his writings in the last couple of weeks on the election. Again, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Sean and Musa, for being here today with us. And uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so I would like to begin with you, Sean, uh, since you sure. uh, worked on this uh, survey that we're kind of basing our discussion on today. Uh, could you describe for folks who might not have been able to uh, take a look at the survey and the report uh, exactly what you all did and uh, what some of the key findings were? Yeah, sure. So we, this project started uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, FIRE kind of got together with Real Clear. Um, we decided to uh, partner with College Pulse to collect the data uh, because College Pulse um, has built out an impressive panel of college students where they are able to identify which campus they are on. Uh, we then selected 55, well, actually we selected 50 to be honest, and then we kind of added five uh, at the end uh, of five additional schools from our, from our pool, our potential pool of schools. Um, and so we wound up with 55 uh, schools in total, slightly less than 20,000 students. Uh, the survey was about 25 questions long. Uh, a couple of questions were really never intended to be a part of our index that we always intended to develop. Uh, these were questions uh, about our current president, uh, Donald Trump. Um, those were kind of there just um, as interesting data points. Um, so like two, two questions that each student got uh, don't really factor into the rankings. Uh, the rest, however, do. Um, we surveyed students uh, on how difficult it was to discuss various topics, um, whether they felt they could have an open and honest conversation about them. Uh, we had items assessing their support for allowing controversial speakers on campus. Uh, we have items assessing the perceived support from the administration for freedom of speech and expression. Uh, we asked students directly about um, whether they've personally self-censored um, and actually to those who indicated um, experience with self-censorship, uh, we followed that up and obtained open-ended responses of descriptions of an at least one instance, some students described more than one, of when they 
engaged in this behavior on campus. So I actually will kind of talk about some of those, at least today. I think they'll add some rich flavor to the discussion. Um, broadly, I mean, I think Brad uh, kind of previewed a little bit of, of what I would say broadly about the results, but the results are sobering, I would say. Uh, there's, there's some stuff in there that I think is actually somewhat positive. Um, like not every student is, you know, uh, against all these controversial speakers or things like that. Um, and a, certainly a number of students say that they feel they can have uh, openness and honest conversations about various issues. Um, I was very encouraged to see when we asked about different modalities uh, that students might be, you know, how comfortable or uncomfortable they were expressing themselves, um, that they felt most comfortable discussing stuff with their peers. Um, they indicated some discomfort, um, challenging a professor on controversial issues. Um, most students had a pretty strong, or it seems like there's a pretty strong fear of social media and putting up uh, dissenting or unpopular opinions on social media accounts that are clearly yours, you know, that aren't anonymous. Um, that's like kind of across the board seemed to be one of the biggest concerns most students had, um, kind of regardless of their political affiliation or their race or their gender. Um, and, but uh, with all that said, you know, I, I think the, the data taken together really show that for a notable portion of students on campus, I, I think you could say they have experienced some kind of chilling effect uh, at times. It might not be all the time, it might not be chronic, but there's certainly plenty of evidence for this, uh, both from the data points from our survey questions, and as I, as I mentioned and hinted at um, in these open-ended responses. So I think that that's kind of the, the real big takeaway is there is an issue with expression on campus um, and it, seems to impact students regardless of their political beliefs, regardless of their gender, regardless of their race, ethnicity, um, et cetera. There are different reasons why say a conservative white male versus a liberal black female might give for why they are afraid to express their views or why they have difficulty expressing their views on campus. But both types of students have that difficulty. Um, I think I'll leave it there. We can have Musa maybe get some observations in and, and get this discussion started. But that's kind of, I think, broadly um, what we can say about this data. Thank you, Sean. So you, you left us at a, a really great point to jump into some further conversation, I think, because when it comes to administrative rules on a campus that limit free speech and, and that uh, limit the individual rights of students, uh, organizations uh, like FIRE, uh, have existed for a long time to, to bring legal challenge and to uh, force, uh, especially those at public schools, to follow uh, First Amendment law. However, what we see in the survey is that there's a different kind of a problem on campus uh, that goes kind of beyond uh, administrative rules and goes deeper uh, than uh, the authority of campus leaders. And, and this is a kind of a cultural uh, problem that we see, uh, that students feel unable to discuss the issues that are most relevant and vital to our national conversation. The exact issues that we want young people to be able to discuss are the ones that they report not being able to discuss. And it, the survey seems to show to us that the students who are sometimes most vitally interested in those questions are the ones who are least able or feel the least able to join the conversation. Mm -hmm. So for example, even though 43% of students on your survey said that it's uh, difficult to have an open conversation about race, 66% of black students said that, mm -hmm. which uh, if one only follows the kind of uh, right-wing conversation mm -hmm. about uh, free expression on campus, one might not think that's the case, but here is the data showing it's the case. Similarly, larger numbers of Hispanic students find it difficult to discuss immigration than any other group. And, and so, Musa, I know that you've been doing a lot of thinking about these issues for a long time. And so I would just like to ask you, how do you understand these cultural issues on campus? And what are some of the barriers that are keeping people from being able to join productive, active conversations about the national issues that face all of us? Yeah, uh, 
So as you noted, um, and as the, the survey data show, uh, oh, black people, uh, black students are some of the most likely to say that they self-censor overall. And this is um, uh, also true specifically uh, with the question of uh, race. What's interesting when you look at the racial question actually is that there's, uh, and, and it's sort of highly relevant to this question of culture and comfort and stuff like this, is that the, when you look at who's uh, least to most comfortable talking about race, the, the sort of order goes basically uh, African-Americans, then Hispanics, then Asians, then whites. So white people are actually the most comfortable talking about race on campus. Uh, but what's interesting about that is that it's, um, is that there's an inverse relationship between uh, different groups level of comfort talking about different racial groups level of comfort talking about race on campus and their levels of prevalence on most campuses. So for instance, uh, white and Hispanic students are more prevalent on campus, Hispanic students uh, less so, and African-American students, especially African-American men, um, less common. Um, so uh, basically it, one, one aspect of it is just the groups that are most the racial groups that are most prevalent on campus seem to be the most comfortable talking about race on campus. Um, so that's that's one thing to note. Uh, but some of the other cultural things that um, play into it, uh, be, in part because actually, because uh, African-American and Hispanic students are a little more rare on campus than, uh, or actually significantly more, less significantly underrepresented compared to their baselines in the population and compared to some other populations. Um, this creates a situation where when race comes up, everyone kind of turns to you, right? And this is actually one way in which a, um, uh, in which sort of the liberal climate on campus um, reinforces that. And, and here's why, uh, because a lot of, especially white students and um, students in general are told that they're supposed to defer to people of color, to their voices, to their experiences, to their perspectives, to their perspectives on a lot of these issues. And how that cashes itself out in class, uh, in classrooms and, and other situations is that uh, a lot of white students is that then when race comes up, all the white students do what they're supposed to do, which is defer to the person of color. And so they all just turn and look at the person of color. And that's an incredibly, alienating. So they're doing what they think they're supposed to do. They, they're doing what they think is the sort of culturally right thing to do, the sensitive thing to do, but it's actually incredibly alienating um, for a lot of the students who are there. And um, another important thing to note is that, of course, uh, a lot of the students of color are figuring a lot of this stuff out themselves, right? Like if you're a Black undergraduate in your first year of college, you're not an expert on race, <laughs> right? You don't have much more data uh, or, or information on, on these issues than any other undergrad. Um, and uh, your own experience, say as an African-American or whatever, might not actually be representative of most other black people. Um, uh, so for instance, a lot of times when we're talking about, and, and also <laughs> there's a sort of distortion between the kinds of issues that we often talk about in say social social research classes versus the kind of experience that most African Americans face. So for instance, when we're talking about race in sociology classes, we usually talk about it in terms of uh, poverty, um, you know, uh, law enforcement, uh, drugs, uh, mm -hmm. crime, things like this. But, you know, uh, most Black people in America don't live in inner cities. They're not poor. They, just, you know, they don't, they, they haven't had violent interactions with police. And the, the subset of the population that you'll find in most universities, even less likely, right? Uh, so when we're talking about poverty and everyone, uh, poverty and how it varies a lot of race, and it turns to the Black kid, and most Black people are poor, as Black kid is even less likely to be poor than most, but everyone's staring at him and waiting for him to weigh in on this. Um, and he doesn't have any experience with poverty, right? So this is um, this is kind of 
how you can get these kinds of um, alienating situations. One other thing that you do note that you do notice though in some of the remarks um, that uh, both in some of the uh, and some of the comments that that the open-ended questions that um, students uh, open-ended respondents that students offer is um, so one end of the, of the discomfort sort of spectrum is uh, everyone kind of turning and looking at them and expecting them to be experts on things that they are not that they couldn't possibly be experts in just in virtue of their skin color. The the flip side though is that uh, sometimes st uh, students of color. Uh, have to listen, feel like they, uh, you know, or listen to white peers making comments that um, are somewhat ignorant or ill-informed or like kind of sweeping statements about various groups when they don't necessarily have a robust knowledge base. And they couldn't, they wouldn't have a robust knowledge base yet because they're undergraduates. And this is part of what the class is there to do is to, to sort of build up that knowledge base, everyone together. But it can be uh, frustrating or alienating for a lot of students to 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 sort of um, have to, uh, to 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 hear those perspectives um, uh, before you know as everyone's uh, so that's part of it. And then last thing I'll uh, uh, just a couple other things I'll tick off that kind of feed into this. Um, there's also a tendency kind of to conform to expectations that's uh, a lot of uh, students of color feel. So there's a certain narrative on uh, racial issues that doesn't necessarily represent how a lot of minority uh, people feel about these issues. Um, and, and this puts you in a kind of precarious situation that is, that's sort of, I think, underappreciated by a lot of uh, people on campus. So, so if you're a first generation student or, a, uh, or an African American student in a, room that doesn't have a lot of African Americans or in an institution that doesn't have a lot of African Americans, you probably feel like your own position in that institution is somewhat precarious. Um, and in some ways, your sort of professional or academic advancement is contingent on you um, pleasing certain institutional gatekeepers or not alienating other, other key people um, around you. Uh, and, and actually, a number of students of, of color are kind of taught, like, for instance, there's a certain narrative that you're expected to master as a student of color in order to, when you're, when you're applying to schools, when you're applying to scholarships, when you're applying to grants, um, and, and the narrative goes something like this. Um, you overcame some kind of adversity, uh, but you also are committed to uh, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, despite coming from a disadvantaged background. But at the same time, you're committed to social justice and to helping other people who weren't able to, to, to make the same kind of leap as yourself. And like as a student of color, uh, when you're applying to schools, when you're applying to scholarships, when you're applying to grants, you're expected to kind of tell this story about how you somehow were, came from some kind of disadvantaged background, even if you didn't, even if you're a middle class black student who kind of went to bougie schools or something like this, that's not the narrative that you're going to tell when you're applying to, to schools, mm -hmm. when you're applying to, right? And, and you're taught this. Um, and so to the extent that you hold views that don't, or that don't conform to that narrative, you might feel like you might, like expressing them would in some way jeopardize your place within the institution. Um, and then uh, the last thing I'll say uh, well, two things. One is also that uh, Black students and Hispanic students, Black people and Hispanic people, immigrant, a lot of immigrant populations in general tend to be more socially conservative and religious than white people on average. And, um, and so, and institutions of higher learning are often places where socially conservative and religious views are not particularly respected or valued. Uh, so one consequence of that is, uh, and this is why the political diversity stuff actually dovetails in many respects with other forms of diversity that people care about. That you have a that's uh, hostile towards socially conservative or religious views. Some of the people that would affect most are students from historically marginalized and underrepresented groups. Um, and in fact, we see from a number of, of uh, research and polling that despite the fact that universities are 
liberal spaces to ask first generation students, lower income students, students of color, do you feel like you belong here? Do you feel welcome here? Uh, a lot of times they say no. Um, and then the last sort of tight tight walk, uh, tight rope that a lot of students of color have to kind of walk though, is that even if you don't personally agree with say, some of the narratives on immigration or on policing, sometimes people are hesitant to push back against those narratives because of concern about how their objections might be used by other people. So we do live in a, in a kind of um, very political environment, a very polarized environment. So if you don't, if you're not completely on board with Black Lives Matter, it's tough to, it's, it can feel tough sometimes to articulate why or that you don't agree and in what senses you don't agree without feeling like you're giving ammunition to people who say, who want to say police reform is bunk, uh, forget it. Uh, like here's a black person who told me that, you know, um, right. Uh, so, so they're in a, a lot of students from historically marginalized and disadvantaged groups are sort of in a very precarious um, social and cultural position within these institutions and navigating that is very uncomfortable. Thank you, Musa. A lot, a lot of uh, interesting things to think through there. And uh, Sean, I know that you mentioned earlier, and I think uh, Musa also alluded to the open-ended responses uh, in the survey. And I think that some of those could help to uh, broaden our perspective and get some some good uh, empirical. Yeah, data. yeah. I was actually waiting for the right time to jump in with some of those. So, a number of the themes that that Musa just mentioned are are certainly present there. Um, you know, a very common one. I'll, I'll just kind of pick. A, I have, like I said, I have a bunch kind of pulled here. Um, very common one of things like this is from a, a black female student at Clemson. I am, you know, this, all of these are in response to. Um, please share a moment where you personally felt you could not express your opinion on your campus. So that's the open-ended prompt. Uh, and so there's a bunch that are effectively like this one. I am usually the only black person in my classroom. Um, racial topics when I am the only person of color in the room. But those are both from uh, black females at Clemson, um, Indiana, anytime in a class with mostly white students. Speaking up uh, for black women doesn't go well. Uh, even if the topic has nothing to do with race, somehow the white community makes it about race and then it will follow being called ignorant or not knowing all the facts, et cetera. Uh, so this is a very common theme that it's, I'm like the only black person in the room um, and that alone makes me uncomfortable or, um, you know, the, the one we hear about a lot too, um, it's hard, uh, basically, when I'm the only one who's, and I'm being looked at to answer these questions. Like, I'm, I'm now being kind of just put on the spot uh, as the token to answer these questions. And, and what's interesting is it's not only um, the Black students who, who report that, as I said, um, have some Asian students who have mentioned this, like, it's hard being on a predominantly white campus to talk about certain issues. Uh, same thing with some of the Hispanic students. So this is a theme that that kind of comes up. Um, certainly, it, it seems like most with with black students, but it, it's also coming up with other minority groups as well. Um, to another one of Musa's points, though, some of the more moderate to conservative minority students, uh, a number of their comments take the flavor of things like, "Well, it's kind of assumed that I'm liberal." <laughs> But I'm, and, and then I feel like I can't say what my true views are on issues like abortion or LGBT rights or transgender rights because I'm also an observant Christian, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's things like that. Um, so I think we, we have, we have this interesting case where the, and I actually graphed this out. I don't. I can't show that. I won't show this right now. But if you actually uh, slice um, by ideology and race, and look at the difficulty discussing the topic of race, um, the effect among the black students is really prominent among both liberal and moderate blacks. 
uh, it's lower among the conservative blacks. It's still like higher than pretty much any of the other groups when you slice it this way, like if you feel the like conservative Hispanic male, et cetera, like that. Um, but it seems to be driven a little bit more by, by the liberal and moderate uh, students. Um, and so that kind of, I think, speaks to these open-ended comments and some of what Musa brought up where it's, it's seen as difficult to, to really push the envelope on the, on the racial issues in, in kind of the progressive direction, uh, despite that kind of being the majority, it's not majority view, I guess predominant view on campus, I would say, um, these students still feel like it's difficult to have those conversations. So I find that interesting. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think these, ideally, uh, and this probably wouldn't come out for a while, but like FIRE, like we do intend actually to do a pretty rigorous uh, content analysis of these open-ended responses. Um, but I have no idea when that'll come out, but I, I think it'll be very rich when it does. And I would encourage um, anyone who's interested in them, these are available on the rankings website. So you can kind of just go browse through them yourself. They're not terribly organized there, but um, you could kind of get a, a sense or flavor of what I'm talking about here. <laughs> well, one thing I'll note too, is that uh, when you look at the overall levels of comfort, um, uh, you know, which, which, which types of schools students feel are, are most likely to feel comfortable discussing matters in general. Um, as noted in the report, a large number of them are um, public universities, state yeah. universities with large student bodies. And that's probably not a coincidence um, and, and for a couple of reasons. One of them being actually that um, sort of at, at state schools, these kinds of schools, actually are much more likely to have um, students of faculty of color and uh, women sort of elite private institutions actually are, are more likely to, uh, their, their professoriate is more likely to be um, homogenous as well, uh, both uh, along ideologically, racially, um, uh, even in terms of gender. Uh, women and minorities are disproportionately likely to teach at uh, sort of state public institutions. So students of, who are from historically underrepresented and marginalized backgrounds themselves are more likely to be in a classroom with a professor who has some kind of life experience that um, is similar to their own and in state institutions than they would be in some of these other schools. Yeah, I would build on that. I mean, we kind of hinted at it in the report and, and I wouldn't, I didn't want, we didn't want to go too strongly with the conclusion because it's like we didn't really like test it in, in like a hypothesis testing way, but it, it, it was, I build on what Musa said, it is pretty apparent that the schools that, most of the schools that quote came out better uh, were larger state institutions. Um, and I think if you connect that to things like spiral of silence theory and, and some other things we know about, um, the conditions in which people self-censor, it makes a lot of sense. Um, at, at a larger school, A, you can you can sink into the background if you want. <laughs> um, you, you just, you know, it's easier to kind of not be noticed when there's more people around. Um, it's also probably more likely that you could find like-minded individuals to have those conversations with because there's more people on campus. Um, it's less risky uh, perhaps to, to say something um, because again, there's more people on campus. So not everybody knows you at a, at a smaller school. Um, and not to like pick on poor DePaul, who was like the only small liberal arts college in our, in our sample of uh, where the, the next run will, will expand that. Um, I mean, they have an enrollment of something like 2,500, 3,000 students. They were by far the smallest school. Uh, I think Dartmouth is the only one that is even relatively, you know, most of the other schools were like double that at least, um, the small schools. So, uh, you know, that's almost an environment where it's like, you don't necessarily know everybody, but it's kind of easy to be pretty noticeable and, and well-known, especially if you're like the person who said the really messed up thing that, or the thing that everybody thinks is really messed up. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that point about the size of the student body is actually pretty important. Um, and in our, our subsequent run of this, which we are working on planning now, um, we're looking away to do something like double to quadruple the size. So go up to something like 150, 200 schools um, with a good chunk of those being some smaller liberal arts schools. So we'll be kind of better able to look at this idea, I think, um, in the next run. 
So one uh, thing that we see when we look at the data is that the problem of self-censorship and the chilling effect uh, on campus is something that affects everyone in one way or another, like all, all these different groups. So uh, some, some topics that all groups on campus find more or less difficult to uh, discuss uh, include gun control and affirmative action. Those kind of have you know, broad levels of discomfort happening. But you know, when we dig more uh, deeply into the data, we find that, for example, uh, students who identify as liberal have a really difficult time discussing the Israel-Palestine mm -hmm. issue uh, with their peers, uh, whereas conservatives find it difficult to talk about topics such as uh, feminism and transgender rights and, and, and abortion. And for those of us who are concerned about campuses becoming places where everyone feels like they can speak openly and uh, have their ideas be part of the conversation, uh, how do we approach the problem on campus in a way that we can help all of these different groups feel to be part of the conversation simultaneously? Because you know, in a politically polarized time, it seems as though one group has this set of things that would help to make them feel more at home. Second group has a completely different set that can seem opposed to some people about what would make them feel at home. So what can college administrators and faculty members do you know, in their own classrooms to create environments where you know, liberals and conservatives, uh, students of all races and backgrounds feel that they don't have to censor themselves and they, they don't feel this chilling effect. It, it seems like there's a, a need to thread a needle uh, and that too often in the free speech movement, uh, people focus on you know, one or the other of these questions, whereas solving both of them simultaneously seems to be the real challenge. Mm -hmm. Musa, I'll, I'll go to you first for your thoughts there. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'll circle back on the on the what to do about it in just a moment. One thing that just occurred to me uh, when I was looking at the data. So, oh, as it relates to political diversity, one thing that you know, oftentimes when when client when when an, when an institution is too politically homogenous, um, that creates an environment where a lot of people, especially on the other side, don't feel comfortable expressing themselves. And we see this predominantly, like overwhelmingly liberal institution, conservatives have a hard time speaking, more conservative skewed um, institutions, liberals have a hard time speaking. But what's interesting is one might think intuitively that schools then that were sort of the most balanced would rank highest um, in terms of overall uh, climate. And that's, we don't see that actually. In fact, one of the schools that's uh, one of the most balanced is actually towards the bottom. Um, and so what's interesting is, it seems like one of the things that, like the sort of, uh, because there are benefits that come with heterogeneity and there are also though benefits that come with, um, uh, with, uh, uh, homogeneity, um, and it seems like the sort of optimal balance actually is to have like solidly in one camp, but not overwhelmingly, but but like with a substantial <laughs> with a substantial minority um, versus being split down the middle or overwhelming one side to the other. And part of the reason for this is those schools probably are able to both uh, to better reap the benefits both of sort of uh, sharing common identity but without the costs that, that are associated with too much insularity. So that was one interesting thing I noted um, when I was looking at the data is that uh, the schools that seem to do best, actually a lot of them were um, decisively left-leaning, just not as overwhelmingly left-leaning as other schools. Um, and, uh, and the schools that were very homogenous tended to do bad regardless uh, and in the split schools. Um, okay. So uh, classrooms, sort of practical, what, what can be done, uh, <laughs> rubber meets the road uh, situation. Um, I mean, I think one of the most important, uh, uh, one of the most important things I think that professors can do is to, one, <laughs> when you're talking, when you're, when you're introducing a controversial issue, present it as something that's complex, um, you know, really lift up when, when you're introducing the issue to begin with, before you open it up to discussion, talk about how it's a complex issue um, with these different dimensions that certain things, uh, that these are the things that we really uh, 
are uncertain about, these are the things that sort of evolve, really like lift up that kind of ambiguity and uncertainty and complexity from the start. Um, because if it presents it as something in which there's a clear um, right and wrong, good and bad, like that kind of manic um, moral whatever, then it, it's really easy for people to fall into. As a good example, I was in a class um, with John McWhorter uh, on sociolinguistics, and he brought up the, um, the issue of preferred pronouns um, using they, them to refer to um, uh, trans people and how it's, um, and how a lot of people find it um, uncomfortable or unusual or, you know, um, unsettling. But he, he introduced, if you had asked me before the class at a university in New York, uh, an Ivy League school in New York, how many people would voice objections to the use of preferred pronouns, right? With a, 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 I would have said negative two Columbia students would feel, would, would feel comfortable to express. Um, but because of the way that John uh, McCorder introduced the subject, presenting this kind of, he, he started by talking about his own uh, sort of uh, wrestling with it about how, uh, about how he finds it a little strange, but how, uh, you know, and he, he wrote a whole article in the Atl Atlantic the week before talking about how, you know, he finds it weird, but he does it and this is why, and, you know. So he kind of started by wrestled, by highlighting how there are considerations that are worth bearing on multiple fronts of the conversation. And then after introducing this complexity, he opened it up for discussion. And lo and behold, there were actually lots of students in the class who also had concerns and discomfort about doing this, but in a way that if he had just started the conversation by going, all right, preferred pronouns, Who's, who, who, who says that you should um, uh, you know, just call people whatever they want, and who thinks that you shouldn't? Raise your hands, right? <laughs> like that would have been a totally different thing. Um, so introducing this complexity and nuance and ambiguity, I think is one thing that's very important. And then the second thing is sort of building up trust and respect. So one thing that's interesting, um, one of the things that generates this kind of uh, censorship uh, thing is that when you're in a classroom, you're basically like trapped with these people for the next 16 weeks, right? So if you do something weird, if you become the weird kid, the pariah, the, the guy with the strange opinions <laughs> or whatever, that's, that, that doesn't just affect that session necessarily, right? The next time you open your mouth and raise a question, you'll have people like, oh, <laughs> like before you even say anything, right? Um, and so, so there's a sort of relationship dynamic here that's very important. There, like there's relationships that persist across sessions for over the course of a, a class and relationships, uh, those are relationships between students and between the students and the professor. And it's important to pay attention to those relationships and to nurture those relationships. And, 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 um, and so to create a sense of trust and respect uh, and, and, and to really uh, focus on that, I think can be helpful. I'll stop there actually, I realize I'm talking a lot. Uh, Sean, I, I would like to spend a little bit of time before we go to the Q&A, and I'll just sure. remind folks if you'd like to ask a question the, to use the Q&A box down at the bottom. Um, so you have put together a, a, a survey, which of course is using some uh, pretty sophisticated survey uh, instruments and te techniques and, mm -hmm. and methodologies. And I wonder if you uh, would like to say just a few words about uh, the, the, the methods behind the survey, some of the kind of academic discussions that have uh, begun around the methods uh, of the survey. Yeah. And then if you could include maybe some thoughts about how academics uh, listening today might be able to use your survey and their own academic work. Yeah, and I will uh, I'll just, I wanna build on very quickly on one of the things Musa said, because I think it's, it's in the, it, it shows up in the data and uh, I think it's important. Uh, I think you could put, and then I'll get to that. Uh, leadership, I think is, is very important. So a lot of what Musa was describing was like leadership from the professor in the classroom, um, modeling, structuring the conversation the right way, modeling like the right kind of behavior. Um, 
there's a lot of these comments it shows up students saying like well i never spoke in that class again because of how the professor handled like when when someone brought this topic up like and they just they set up a very intimidating environment or the professor has made it very clear what their views are and they control my grade i'm not going to really push back against them too harshly so that shows up but i i bring it up more i think the administrators um and the presidents and, and the leaders uh at the institution uh have a lot to do with this too uh the university of chicago is number one because of largely because of that administrative support score that they got which is miles ahead uh like that sub factor they are like well ahead of the second place school like that i think is if you really dig into the numbers that's almost solely responsible uh for them being the number one school and their president has been very clear on their stance on these issues and the type of culture that they want to establish on campus. And I think that goes a long way. Kansas State, similar. President and the administration has been similar. Same thing with like Texas A&M, uh, UCLA is up there as well. Um, and so I, I think leadership has has something to do with it. Like, I don't, it's, it's a little bit harder to figure out how to like, increase openness and tolerance and et cetera, et cetera. Like that's, that seems to be a much bigger <laughs> involved project, but things that schools can do right away is they can make their stance on these issues clear as to what type of culture um, they do want to establish on campus. Um, so I just wanted to hit that first because I, it, it's, I think it goes with some of what it builds and goes with what Musa was saying. Um, and, and so I really do think that that is a step uh, schools can take. Um, and then I will also on the ideological diversity thing point out that the U Chicago actually isn't very ideological diverse. So I think that again, this leadership point feeds into that, um, that they, their administration is very clear of, of what they want to set up. They still are overwhelmingly liberal in the student body. It was like, I think they're like 70 to 75% liberal and it's like 10 to 12% conservative and the rest are moderate. Uh, so I think they're, they're, they're a good case to maybe look at, um, for improvement. Um, okay. So in terms of methods with the survey, you know, um, I, we meet, like we, I think in, you know, are based on research, based on prior research in political science, political psychology, our own experience, um, kind of just anecdotally uh, what one would think. We, we certainly figured things like openness or, or willingness to have a discussion about controversial topics uh, is a very good indicator of the climate on campus for expression. And so that's why we kind of have that series of questions uh, in political science literature, tolerance for controversial speakers has long been or, or support or opposition for controversial speakers in your community or on your campus, et cetera, has long been uh, a, a measure of tolerance. Um, you know, this goes back to Sammy Stouffer's studies in the 1950s. Uh, this was then adopted by the General Social Survey, this methodology. Um, you know, it's largely considered the, the, um, the, like the main way or the gold standard way of measuring tolerance. Uh, so that's why we went with that. Uh, on the speakers themselves, um, I'd be, I, I think we might want to consider a, a slightly different mix. Um, I think uh, half to maybe, at least half to, to maybe five probably are, are more, uh, they're going to be more strongly opposed uh, by people who lean to the left. And then, so there's only like three or so that, that probably are, are more strongly opposed by people on the right. Um, you know, I think the student body is predominantly liberal. So that's, I mean, I think our data shows that. And, and I think that's not a controversial thing to say. So I, I think it's not that off the wall to have it slightly skewed that way. I mean, you're, you're trying to measure tolerance and, and what is likely to trigger a protest on a campus. Uh, it's probably not the liberal speaker um, coming saying Black Lives Matter. It's it's probably the conservative guy coming being like, yeah, Blue Lives Matter too. Uh, that's probably far more likely to trigger the protest or, or the anger on campus. So I, I 
would be open to considering some different speakers there. Um, I think that's the type of thing that as if we continue to run this project, uh, I'd love to do it every year, kind of like a general social survey thing. You know, at some point speakers are gonna cycle out because stuff just isn't relevant anymore and, and issues change and, and what, become the hot, what becomes the hot button issue changes. And that's the same for the, the openness question of, of which topics do you find difficult to discuss? You know, transgender rights is on there as one of the topics. I mean, 20 years ago, that's people would be like, I don't, what, what, what are you talking about? Um, that wouldn't have really been, maybe on a campus it would have been, but it's in, in the general public, it wasn't even like a registering so much in the general conscious. So uh, there will need to be tweaks to the items over time. Um, the way, honestly, academics, can help, can work with this data is that the data is available. The data are available um, through College Pulse's website. It's a little annoying to get to. You gotta go into the insights panel where you're actually exploring the data. There's a way to download a CSV uh, that includes a code book so you can make sense of what all the numbers mean in there and you can analyze it yourself. So you can kind of create your own constructs based on the variables that are in there uh, and look at things. But honestly, we would love to hear thoughts on are there factors or con underlying constructs that are relevant to this question of how to measure the expression climate on campus that, that we haven't assessed, uh, that, that we might want to consider assessing? Um, are there different ways of assessing the ones we've factored into the rankings already? Um, these are all like discussions that are, are ripe for, for scholars to get involved in, I think, just because we, we did it one way like, where this is, Look, we are we are open to changing it if, if there are basically other factors that we need to account for, if there's better ways to ask the questions. Um, so we, that's, I think, largely what I'd love to hear from other academics on. But we also encourage you to tap into the data yourselves because there's a lot there. Thank you, Sean. Uh, so let's now turn to some of the questions from the audience. And uh, just a reminder that the little box at the bottom of the screen says Q&A is the way to submit questions. Uh, so we will start well with this one, which uh, I believe, uh, Sean, you'll probably be uh, most qualified to answer in terms of the survey itself, um, which is, how do you think the results regarding student willingness to have uh, difficult conversations would change, if at all, uh, if we specified or you specified different settings on campus, different locations, for example, uh, in classrooms versus in a public forum versus in a dorm. Uh, we may have lost Sean, unfortunately, so I'm going to keep I can, that I question. Can, I can oh, speak a little bit to that, actually, because there is some some research from previous fire studies and other places while we're waiting for Sean to come up. Uh, one of the things that you see um, in some other research, I can't speak specifically to, because to, I don't have the, um, on this one, but other fire studies, for instance, have shown um, one of the places, and, and uh, as noted, actually, one of the places where students feel least comfortable to talk about, uh, to talk is online. And the reason for this is because then it's not interactions with people who are your peers or whatever, but these are kind of uh, conversations on the record, which can be used by a bunch of other people who don't know you, who don't know the context, who can be taking it out of context and kind of attack mobbing you. Um, so that's one place where students feel less comfortable uh, talking. Um, classrooms is another uh, for two reasons. Um, one, as Sean noted, because a number of students are concerned about uh, being punished by professors uh, for, for, for saying the wrong thing. Uh, or just being kind of humiliated in front of their peers by saying something that wasn't accurate and the professor is like, actually, that's not true. Uh, just kind of in a, right? Um, and then there's still the social dimension of managing your relationships with your peers that you're leveraging too. So in the classroom, it's sometimes another place. But as uh, Sean noted, oftentimes uh, when, when you're talking private settings with your peers outside of in less public context, less public than the classroom, less public than online, Student, people do feel more comfortable um, exchanging ideas. Sean. <laughs> Sorry, my internet decided to crap out for a second. And I think I'm actually connected using my phone now. But uh, <laughs> we, can, we can hear it's you louder here now. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'll, I'll repeat the question for you, just assuming that you yeah, get the whole I thing. Yeah, I do not. Um, so uh, an audience member is uh, interested if 
uh, if the survey were to specify different settings in which conversations uh, and interactions would be happening, for example, uh, dorms versus public fora versus classrooms, would that change uh, remarkably, do you think, the kind of results you get on these uh, openness uh, questions? I, I do think it would. Um, I, I think based on the responses that students seem to feel comfortable discussing controversial political issues with their peers, uh, I think you would see more openness in like dorm room setting versus the classroom. I mean, I think Musa made a great point about a classroom and a college course. Uh, it's not just like you're there for like an hour and a half and then you're moving on with your life. Like you're in this course for 15, 16 weeks. You're there once or twice a week. If you're attending every, every course, every class, uh, you're seeing these people a lot. Uh, if you're known as the weird person who has the crazy opinions, that's gonna be much different versus like being in the dorm where you, you can kind of pick and choose who you're interacting with, right? You have more control over who you're interacting with. Uh, I think you would see, I do think you would see differences. Um, it gets tricky, you know, so there's, it, it, it's tricky to incorporate something like that because you want to be mindful also of length and, and survey fatigue. Um, so I, yes, I, I think we should try to do something like that, but it also, there, there are some constraints because you don't want to have a survey that takes 45 minutes for people to complete. Uh, because likely after the first 15 or 20, your, the quality of your response is not gonna be as good. Um, so. Okay. Next question from the audience. Uh, we have a, a college professor. Uh, next semester, I'm teaching a course called Hate Speech and Philosophy. Do you have suggestions on how to introduce and incorporate the report into the course? What elements would you, you suggest I capitalize on within the report? Hmm. I think, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll weigh in. I think one of the things that you should definitely focus on, again, is the, um, actually, and this would be a nice, a nice segue into the core themes of the course, would be talking about, uh, you could lead with the fact that a lot of people of color don't feel comfortable talking about racial issues on campus. A lot of, his, uh, like a lot of black people don't feel comfortable talking about race. A lot of Hispanics don't feel comfortable talking about immigration. Um, why is that? <laughs> like that would be uh, a, nice, um, a nice segue, especially insofar as the class is focused a lot on um, uh, uh, probably on, on sort of uh, hate speech as it relates to things like race. Um, and it's similarly, uh, with respect to anti-Semitism, talking about how a lot of liberal students don't feel comfortable talking about um, Israel-Palestine. Why is that? Uh, you know, is that bound up in some way with perceptions of anti-Semitism? In what sense? Um, what does, you know, um, so I think those are some sort of springboards, but I'll let Sean go. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, we actually didn't, I, I think to build on what Musa said, we didn't, I didn't we didn't talk much about uh, the set of variables that look at acceptability of protest, uh, but I think that could be another way. Um, you know, effectively, you introduce, as Musa said, you introduce this idea, this topic, and then can segue into some of the data points on like some of the speakers are very, very strongly opposed. Uh, very strongly opposed, uh, like, you know, over 80% of students basically say somewhat or strongly oppose this. this person appearing on campus. Uh, and then when you start slicing by kind of the different groups, you can get into the 90 percentage points for some of them. Um, you could then kind of so you talk about that. And then we could look at, you know, there's, it's not a big percentage, but you know, there's, there's percentages of students saying, well, violence would be acceptable. And so I think that that um, to, to stop a speaker or an event from happening on campus or, or it would be okay to physically block entry uh, to this event. Um, talking about kind of talking about the hate speech issue in this way and, and being like, well, you know, and I actually, I think I understand why a number of people would say violence is rarely acceptable because like there might be an instance where I don't think I would even say never to that question, to be honest, uh, because there, there might be an instance where you think a, a certain response is appropriate. And so I think that's a kind of a way 
in, in terms of a, to get a deep philosophical conversation going, it's like, well, if 1% saying, yeah, sure, violence is always acceptable and like three or 4% saying sometimes, the vast majority of the, I think it's, I think it's 18%, find some level of violence acceptable. The vast majority of them are saying it's rare, rarely acceptable. And so I think that gets into kind of a philosophical question of why. Why would it be acceptable for this speaker here, uh, but not for this speaker over here who's basically just saying we should support Israeli military policy as as the US government? (laughs) One quick thing I'll add to that. So on page 17 of the fire report, um, includes a chart that Sean referred to earlier where um, would you be supportive of having this kind of speaker speak on yeah. this? And what's interesting is there's like a dramatic asymmetry there for almost all of those charts, where the number of people who are um, opposed, uh, when you look at the number who are opposed versus the number who are supportive of, and then there's there's people in the middle, right? So it's not that, um, so it's not like the people who are opposed uh, to having the, the speaker speak on campus, all the rest of the population is supportive. In fact, it's actually a smaller than that share of the people who are um, supportive of, uh, uh, who are actually supportive of letting them speak. And this matters um, because in many, uh, in many cases, uh, if you don't have, <laughs> even if you don't agree with, okay, so one of the things that comes up in a lot of the surveys and um, when you look at the sort of illiberal students, the students who are who are willing to use violence and other coercive tactics to shut down ideas they disagree with. In this report, and in most of them actually, uh, we've talked about this before, Sean, it's, some, it's a small number of students who, who fall into this illiberal camp. You're talking about something like maybe 20, 25% of, of students who are willing to, in, uh, who have like genuinely intolerant or illiberal tendencies. But the reason, but they're empowered in many respects because a lot of the people who don't necessarily agree uh, with their approach aren't on, aren't, you know, opposed either. (laughs) They're kind of in the middle, right? So so they might not agree with um, the, with the methods, but they don't oppose, they don't actively oppose them either. And in many cases, they sympathize with the aims, even if they disagree with the means. Um, And and they certainly don't want to be the person, if this person is taking an uh, illiberal um, uh, mode of resistance against something that's perceived to be racist, you don't want to be the person who is resisting that for fear of being perceived as being aligned with racists yourself. Oh, you're trying to stop me from fighting the racists? Why? Is it because you're a racist, um, right? Uh, and so, and so the part of the reason why sometimes the the illiberal students are able to exert disproportionate influence over how a situation plays out, despite being in a very small minority, is because the they're they're sort of empowered or enabled in many senses by a larger share of students who are um, who don't necessarily agree with them, but aren't actively opposed to them either. And that kind of ambivalence creates a situation where they're able to exercise disproportionate um, force. Yeah, so uh, there's evidence of that in, in these open-ended responses where students will say like, you know, uh, the extreme liberals and the extreme conservatives on this campus just really create this environment where no one else can can kind of have this like nuanced view or opinion. Um, and, and so, you, or, or it's just a more general comment about like, oh, well, honestly, whenever any of these issues comes up, it's like, you just know not to say anything because it's just gonna cause problems and who wants to deal with that and, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so it's, it's, it's like an, ambi- it's, it's, it's uh, from a number of students, it's like an ambivalence kind of, it's like, a, I don't, it's not worth it for me to do this versus like, if I do say something, you know, what's gonna happen, basically. So uh, next question from the audience uh, is an interesting one. Um, They ask, how are the questions regarding self-censorship phrased? Because we often self-censor in some degrees in ways that are not worrying. Uh, But of course, there are other instances where self-censorship is worrying. 
So are, is there an attempt in the survey to try attempt to distinguish between what we might think of as appropriate self-censorship uh, versus the kind of more chilling effects of self-censorship that we worry about? Yeah, so, so the question actually asks, um, have you personally felt you could not express your opinion on a subject because of how students, a professor, or the administration would respond? So it, it's it's getting at that you're afraid of the consequences from these people. Um, that being said, you know, yes, I could say that there are some comments, um, you know, people who said they self-censored when they were asked to explain the experience. There's there's a small portion of comments where it's like, well, I was doing it because I didn't want to like hurt people's feelings, or I was doing it because you know I don't know a lot about that topic. Um, which I wouldn't, those I wouldn't, I wouldn't consider not knowing a lot about the topic actual really like self censorship. That's being like I'm ceding the ground to the people that know more about this. Um, and then yeah, like also like I'm just you know I'm being polite. Like that's not necessarily the worst thing in in every situation either. Like not every, you don't have to get into every issue every time it comes up necessarily. It would be my opinion. Um, you know that question could probably be tweaked um, a little more, uh, made a little more narrow uh, to make it more about you're fearing a negative reaction. Um, and I actually also think we should add kind of a frequency follow up to like yes you said you did like how often does this happen um because you, if it's only happening very rarely i think that's less of i mean less of a problem than if someone is saying oh yeah this happens all the time uh, on this campus let me piggyback on that um so the previous uh a previous fire um study on free speech uh asked students sort of who uh asked a, a yeah. little bit more detail about um sort of uh about why you said self about why you self-censor um and uh yeah a number of them a number of students did say that part of the reason they self-censor is because they're worried that they're incorrect or they're wrong or yeah. they might be wrong and uh and on the one hand that's kind of comforting uh or, or maybe desirable but on the other hand it's actually kind of not desirable right yeah. because if you have an incorrect idea or opinion in your head, one of the ways in which it could get corrected is if you surface that idea and you find out, oh, it's not accurate actually. And, and then you leave with a better understanding of the world. That's in large part, that's kind of the point <laughs> of, of education, right? Um, so in, in an environment where students don't feel like they can, uh, don't feel comfortable being wrong, you should be comfortable yeah. being wrong. A lot of the things that, like so much, almost a lot of what people believe at any given time in history turns out to be wrong later, right? We're wrong a lot. But the way you get better is by finding out what's wrong and what's right. And mm -hmm. so, so, so there's one sense in which it's sort of unfortunate and cuts against the kind of pedagogical purpose of institutions of higher learning when people who who have questions or or views that they're not sure if they're correct or not don't feel comfortable expressing them. Um, that's sort of unfortunate from a pedagogical standpoint, even if from a kind of social standpoint, in some senses, it feels good that someone's not just spouting something kind of on weak, right? Um, so I'll flag that. And then I'll say another thing that some students are concerned about, uh, offer concern about frequently is again, being punished by their teachers and grading. Uh, fortunately for them, uh, the research, uh, available research does suggest that professors don't really um, punish students, undergraduates, for holding, uh, in, for holding views that differ from their own in terms of grading. Ideological prejudice and discrimination does exist, but it becomes more pronounced as the stakes increase. So when people are applying to grad school, when people are applying for the jobs in the professoriate when people are trying for promotion and peer review and institutional review boards. Those are where you see ideological discrimination. For most professors, they have to read a whole stack of papers this high. They don't want to be dealing with parents and administrators and other people who are angry if they get um, a low grade. They don't want to be docked in student evaluations through giving people low grades. So they're not going to be like, oh, you undergrad who's views I don't necessarily take seriously to begin with, I'm going to create all of these problems for myself by giving you a lower grade than you deserve, right? So that, that doesn't usually happen. Um, but they feel it happens, but they're worried about it. And that's a problem, right? So that's, that's one of these sort of cultural issues where even if professors 
aren't likely to, to punish their students for in terms of grading for yeah. saying disagreeable things. A lot of students feel like yeah. that will happen. Um, and then the last thing I'll note is that a number of students do uh, in, in the fire previous fire research and other research do say that one of the reasons they self censor other than those two is uh, for fear of sort of social alienation yeah. from their peers. Um, yeah. And one of the sort of disturbing uh, follow up things that the fire uh, study from uh, 2017 or 16 or 17, I think is when they came out with those. Yeah, it's the most the most recent yeah. one uh, showed is that um, I think it's 2018. Maybe. Anyway, what it showed is that uh, they asked students, how do you respond? How would you respond if one of your classmates um, said something that you found offensive or disagreeable? Would you try to understand uh, sort of where they were coming from? Would you avoid interaction with them in the future, et cetera, et cetera? Like only a small share of students, about 20%, said that they would try to understand where this person was coming from. A large majority said that they would probably curtail interaction with them in the future. Mm -hmm. So this perception that a lot of students have that saying something weird would result in social sanction isn't an inaccurate perception. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it, it does have consequences. And that, that, that is one thing that does um, uh, tamp down expression that's a little bit harder to control, but not, not completely out of the realm. So uh, one of the uh, things you mentioned, Musa, is actually related to a question from the audience, which is, were graduate students included in the survey? Might it be that they feel self-censorship in a deeper way, impacting the direction of the research questions they ask? Okay, so the survey was only undergraduates at four-year institutions. Um, I personally, and, and this is something that we at FIRE are hoping to do and expand. Uh, I mean, this is, the, our rankings right now are based on the student survey responses and, you know, the FIRE spotlight rating for speech policies uh, was a component. But I really don't, that is not in any way shining the light on the entire campus. There's, as this question notes, graduate students, uh, which as Musa pointed out, I think that could be, uh, there's probably a higher pressure. There's, there's certainly more pressure, I think, to self-censor in a setting like that. Um, you know, I, I don't even remember what year this was. Uh, but I have a, a qualitative paper that I that I co-authored with uh, Lee Jossum and some others, where uh, it's a lot of personal experiences of people um, in this in psychology. Uh, but a number of them are people saying, "Well, you know, I was told not to pursue uh, this line of research until I got tenure because it's just too controversial, and you know that that's better saved for when you have the protection of of full tenure and you're not going to be, uh, you know." basically put on the chopping block for having this unpopular research program. Um, so I think surveying faculty, surveying graduate students, I think is, it would also, if you really want to get a full snapshot of, of what it's like on a campus, um, those are two other important uh, constituencies. Um, I'll note there was a recent report that came out of the UK uh, where they, it was easier for them to survey faculty because most of it is through the British government. Uh, but there's a lot of concern over what might happen with academic freedom there. Um, and I think there's concern here. Um, anecdotally, um, there's this uh, incident recently at USC uh, in the business school where a communications professor was, um, the, the controversy was over his use of a Chinese word that in Chinese is, is, is a filler like um or uh, uh, but it sounds like a racial slur in English. Um, his reason for bringing up this example was this was a graduate level business course. And he was making the point that if you're in international business, uh, you might wind up in a situation where this happens and you probably don't want to like get offended at this person because it means X in your language and it means something entirely different in their language. Um, Professor admitted he probably could have used a better example given the current climate and everything, but he had used this example before uh, and it wasn't problematic. That's not actually why I'm bringing any of this up. What happened was USC then surveyed the faculty of the business school um, and received, from what I can tell, a pretty hefty response rate. 
Um, there was about there were over a hundred professors that responded, and the, the schools, business schools, academic staff is something like two hundred people, and so that that's that the academic staff doesn't just include the professors, right? So a good chunk of the professors in this department responded, and most of their open-ended comments were effectively like, "The administration has failed us. They've made it clear they won't defend me." I'm worried about my ability to teach, my ability to research, et cetera. Like I'm going to retire, things like that. Um, so I think that's a growing concern, and and that's a certainly a factor that should be considered when you're saying what the climate is like on a given campus. Yeah, one thing I'll flag real quick is that one of the one of the challenges of polling grad students is that, um, or or surveying grad students. Uh, is that a, a number of ways it would change is that a lot of the students who don't conform to the sort of prevailing culture on campus don't end up pursuing grad school at all. As a result of their baccalaureate experience, instead of trying to say become a professor, even if they're interested in academia, they move on to other fields. In many cases, they self-select out of the academy. That doesn't always happen, but it does happen. And so that that um, and so part of the reason you might see some differences. Um, so the stakes are higher, but then it's also a different pool of people who end up becoming, um, yeah. going into grad school versus not. And then the last thing that I'll flag is that um, uh, Sean put his nose on, uh, his no, his finger on the nose uh, of, <laughs> of something that um, happens a lot. Uh, a lot of times students are advised, um, grad students are advised, and early career scholars, even when you're professors, are advised to avoid certain kinds of research until you get tenure because there will be professional repercussions if you step out of line. And they, they advise you on this. Now, the, um, the problem with this, uh, and, and there's a lot of research on faculty, especially conservative faculty. Um, one of the reasons why we don't even, um, there's this book called Passing on the Right, which shows that conservative faculty tend to avoid research on controversial topics. Um, at all in order to avoid putting themselves in a situation where the differences between them and their peers are made salient. So they try to avoid putting themselves in that situation at all. One consequence of this, and this is my last thought, is that um, that advice that once you become, once you get tenure, then start doing things that challenge the orthodoxy. That's very bad advice. Uh, like, and here's why. One, if you've spent the last, you know, basically 15, 20 years keeping your head down, avoiding making waves as you work your way through grad school and then through the tenure track process, you're not suddenly going to become a revolutionary um, after you get that tenure process. You're no longer that revolutionary person. You're the person avoids making waves. You spent the last 15 years doing that. You never, it, it is never the case. It's a, a modest kind of safe coloring and uh, you're kind of enculturated and your sort of way of thinking and approaching issues is just different as a result of that. Um, so uh, so that's why I personally don't take that advice. <laughs> so I just kind of, <laughs> um, uh, I study the things that are interesting to me and I pursue the things that are interesting to me. And, you know, uh, honestly, um, uh, there could be consequences for that, but, you know, you also have to live with integrity and you have to be pursuing things that you enjoy and doing things that you think are valuable. And, um, and so I would encourage people to not, um, I play the game to an, ex you know, to an, ex to the extent that's necessary to make yourself comprehensible to your peers or whatever, but, um, but also, you know, genuinely follow your interests.